Spike level. Uh, long time lurker on the mailing list, been to a lot of these things, given a lot of these things, and we'll just go ahead and get into this. Uh, so first off, how many of you have heard of Ceph? Okay, decent number. How many of you have actually used Ceph? Two and a half. <laughs> you probably don't count. Okay. At least if you're counting at, at Bluehost, no. <laughs> okay. So um, to start off with, this is going to be a high-level talk about what Ceph is and the architectural components and uh, a little bit of demo of different ways that Ceph can be used. This is not going to be a um, how to set Ceph up tutorial. Um, there are doc documents online about how to do that. Uh, there are various other or various deployment mechanisms that are available. So I'm, if, if you're going to do that, I'm going to leave that as a uh, uh, an exercise for the viewer. Um, this hopefully will give you a little bit of the background, so that as you're seeing terms used in the documentation, they make some sense to you as to what they are. Um, so I've I've titled this the introduction to Ceph or building an object store in five parts. Um, the links down there. Uh, Hopefully, if you want them, you've had a little bit of time to write them down or pull them up on your device. Uh, those are the, the slides that I'm using, though there might be a change or two out of date. Either way, we'll get to that when we get to it. So to start off with, let's build a, a hypothetical object store. And um, so I, I should say that I wasn't there for or when Ceph was originally being built. Uh, it actually, some of the, the initial releases of it were in the mid to late 2000s, um, and I didn't start using it at all until about 2014. Um, so I can't say for sure that this is the uh, line of thought that the um, developers went through, but it's how I think about it given my background with object storage, which I have been doing since 2007. So to start off with, we first need to make a definition of what is an object. Uh, most basically, an object is going to just be a sequence of bytes, very much like a file. Uh, let's see, let me just go ahead and bring these up. Very much like, like a file you would find on your file system. Um, an object has a, a, a name. Uh, I'm going to add the caveat here, it has a unique name. Um, they can optionally store additional attributes. So uh, depending on what file systems you, you may have used on Linux, uh, the extended attributes features, you can think of this kind of like uh, extended attributes. It lets you define a, a key value pair that gets associated with an object that you can then query uh, the object for those, those keys and values later. Um, one very important point about this is there's no inherent uh, or implied directory hierarchy like you would find on a regular POSIX file system. These are just objects that have a name that are stored inside of a system and you refer to them by that name. All right, let me look at my notes real quick, see if there's anything I missed here. Ah, another important point is that um, our, our hypothetical object store while it knows that there is data in the object, it doesn't know anything about the contents of that data. It doesn't care about the contents um, because it, it doesn't modify them uh, in any way. Uh, and back to the, uh, the directory or the, the no in, inherent directory structure uh, and whatnot, we're also going to say that uh, it's the responsibility of the client to keep track of uh, the names of objects or be able to generate them, etc. Question. So is this just off your definition here? Is it a lot like Amazon AWS or? It is very similar. S3? It is very similar to, to the S3 buck, uh, buckets and, and objects inside of them. Um, there are some some differences. This is kind of a more generic abstraction from that, and we're actually going to talk about S3 uh, a little bit later. Do you happen to know what's behind the scenes with S3? Is it Ceph or something? So the question is, do I know what's behind the scenes with, with S3? Um, I do not. Um, my understanding is that it's a completely custom built solution for Amazon. It um, Ceph. Yeah, it predates Ceph significantly. Is Ceph real new? 
Uh, it's about 10 years old at this point. So uh, the question was, is if Seth is new? And no, it's, it's uh, uh, I first heard about it, I think, in 2009. Uh, and that's when some of the initial um, kernel components to access a Ceph uh, cluster were added to the, to the mainline Linux kernel. So it's, it's been around for a while. In fact, some of the papers associated with it uh, date back to about 2006. So it's, it has been around for a while. All right, so we're going to, to design our hypothetical object store. We have some requirements for, the ob for, for this object store. Of course, we want to be able to write data to the cluster. If we can't add something to it, not all that useful. More importantly, we want to be able to read the data back. Just being able to write, I mean, who, who needs a distributed object store where you, where you can just write to dev null if you, if you don't want it back? So um, we want our data to be distributed. And in this case, we, what this means is we want it spread across multiple storage locations. Um, now, this location could mean a number of different things. It could be uh, different drives within the same host. It could mean different hosts in a rack. It could be different data centers, different geographical locations. Uh, but the, the actual details of that we're, we're not going to go into right now, but we want the data to be spread across multiple locations. And that we also want our data to be fault tolerant with spreading it across those different locations. Um, and more importantly, we want it to automatically handle failures in the cluster uh, for, for those, well, no one likes being woken up in the middle of the night because a, a drive died. If the system can handle that itself, all the better. So we're going to have that as a requirement. And lastly, data should be consistent. With writing the data in multiple locations, we want to make sure that it, that it is written the same in all locations or sufficient locations so that we can know for sure the data is always going to be the same. Also, that the ordering of those writes are consistent uh, and, and don't get rearranged uh, in any way. All right, so now with those few definitions and requirements, let's talk about how we're going to actually build our hypothetical object store. To start off, we're going to have objects, and we're going to have storage servers. And it's going to look something like this. So say we have a file, in this case notes.txt, and we have four storage servers. So we need to uh, dis distribute this object across those different storage servers. In this example and through the rest of it, we're going to assume that we want two copies to be written of every block of data or every object. So in this case, we're just going to randomly pick two. And we're going to write the object to those two storage servers, in this case, two and four. There's a problem with this, though. And it violates, or it makes our second requirement very hard, which is if the, if the data is randomly distributed, how do you know where it is to get it back? Um, there are ways to handle this. Um, and I, I have, I've used a object store that, that did this. And uh, the way that it, it got the data back was it just sent out a message to everyone saying, do you have this file? <laughs> um, and hope that sufficient uh, answers come back. Um, it works. It's not the most efficient, but it's also really cheap and easy to code. So um, other than that, there's not really a way to get the data back. And if we can't get the data back, like I said, we're no better than dev null. I've heard that Google has a good way of getting data back. What's that? Such a system. Basically, they have servers which, so when they ask for what the file is, they hash or get a hash out of it. Uh -huh. They're out of the name, and then they ask a index server, hey, do you know if something that belongs to this hash? And then it will go ahead and direct you to a cluster of nodes. You're getting ahead of me. <laughs> okay. So, and that's actually on this next slide. We have a couple of solutions to this. We can store a mapping inside of some other uh, service. Um, uh, various object stores do similar things. Um, many of the quote unquote clustered HPC uh, si file systems take this approach where they have some form of server that is storing metadata that maps 
objects to storage locations. Um, and so this has a, a, a potential bottleneck in that all your clients are having to perform operations talking to the, this one or set of metadata servers. If you have multiple, you have to figure out how to keep them in sync, uh, and distribute the data across them. And so that has its own particular set of challenges. Um, the other way is we could use some attribute about the object. We can perform some math on it and generate uh, some kind of mapping on our own. Uh, there are various things we can use. We can use the contents of the object. Uh, the one that I talked about earlier that I, I used where it just asked everyone, it, used the con it just did a hash on the contents of the object uh, to, to give it an identifier. Um, you can also use the object name. You can use a combination of various other things. And you're probably going to use some form of a hash function. And so at least for the time being, let's just use a simple algorithm. We'll md 5 sum the object name. We'll do a mod function on how many storage servers there are. And the resulting number is what storage server gets the object. So that's the approach we'll adopt for our hypothetical object store. Which leads us into part two objects map using hashes. And it looks something like this, which is not too different from what we had before. Um, we take an MD5 sum of notes.txt, mod four, we get zero. Uh, for our second copy, we're just gonna increment the number that we get out of it. And so we're gonna store it on our first. So the servers are named one index, but math in this case is zero indexed. So we'll use the first two servers as our storage locations. So great, we, we have that. And when we want to look an object up, we just perform the, the same hash function on the object name. We can know where it's at and get the data back. But this has its own set of problems. Um, recovery can be somewhat painful in this situation. If an, ob uh, an object server goes down, um, we don't necessarily have a mapping of what objects were on that storage server. Um, there are ways that, you, that this can be dealt with, um, but when we have a failure, we need to be able to, to get a list of objects that are degraded and perform recovery on those objects. Uh, if you don't have something else, the easiest way is you just record and log somewhere of what you've written to a storage server, but that has its own headaches as well. What would be easier is if we could just ask another storage server what it has and uh, do a comparison then. Uh, the other thing with uh, our uh, just using a, a hash function, uh, the other, another problem we have is that whenever we add or remove storage servers, that hashing changes. And we then have to go through every object inside of the cluster and adjust where it's at, which potentially causes a lot of background uh, operation um, and also, during that change, your, your clients might be doing the wrong mapping and getting either not finding data or finding wrong data. So uh, two potential problems there. So the way we're going to solve this is we're going to create some object buckets. And what these are is they're not so much a, a physical thing, but they're just a logical mapping that maps. We, we map an object to, an, to a bucket. And then that bucket we map to uh, our storage servers. And then when we need to do recovery, we can just go through all those buckets, find out what um, a, a member of that has that data is still up and running is, and use the list of it, or f of objects that it has, to do recovery. And we know then we're back into a, a, a sane state. And so that brings us to part three, where we have object buckets. And it looks something like this. Uh, if you're pulling the slide deck off my website right now, you might find a slightly out of date version of this that has, that has a, an error. But anyways, this is how it would look uh, in this situation. So we take a, an MD5 sum of notes.txt. Here we define that we have six buckets. And so we uh, mod the MD5 sum by, by six, we get two. And um, so we go, we map that to bucket two. And then bucket two, we're going to map to servers one and four. 
pretty simple. There is the question then of how do we map the buckets to the storage servers? For the time being, it's magic. We will come back to this question. But uh, for, for, for the purposes of where we're at right now, we don't need to worry about it. So now we have our next problem of how do we know what the state of the environment is? How do we know which um, storage servers are online, what the state of the various uh, buckets is, um, which objects are, are consistent, which ones are not? Um, we need, to, we need to come up with a way of determining this so that, for example, when clients do their mappings, they, they can reach the right locations, et cetera. And so our, our solution for this is we're going to use a distributed consensus algorithm. Um, there are a number of these out there uh, right now. Two of the most popular ones are Paxos and Raft. Um, there are a lot of other uh, software projects that have been getting a lot of traction the last couple of years that use these. Um, I'll just go ahead and, and spoil the fun. We're going to use Paxos. That's what Seth is doing. Um, and we're going to, to have a, a limited set of daemons. Can, you, can, can I ask you why they picked Paxos? Is it just because I do not know the reasoning why they picked Paxos. Is Seth old enough that Raft wasn't available? Because Raft is fairly recent. Probably. When, when did Raft come out? Yeah, I, 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 it might predate Raft. Um, like I said, I, don't, I wasn't there for the decision, so I don't know why they chose uh, Paxos over Raft. But, uh, and, and I actually, I know there, there are different implementations that perform about the same thing, but I particularly don't know many of the, yeah, the implementation detail differences. Yeah, and, so, yeah, and that, if it was old enough, then that Paxos would have been the only one. Yeah, so anyways. Um, and so with uh, our part four and distributed consensus, we have something that looks like this. Off to the side, we have a couple manager processes that are communicating amongst uh, each other, and they're performing the distributed consensus. So, and then each of the, the servers and also all the clients talk to the managers to find out what the current state of the cluster is. Um, in that, they'll find out which storage servers are, are up and down, they can do some, some basic communication uh, for uh, some other operations. The, the other big thing is they'll get variables about how data is being mapped. And the clients and the other, and the storage servers will use this to know who they need to talk to uh, for, for each other's operations. I don't have all the, all the lines drawing who talks to the manager, but everyone's going to at some point. Yes. If, if the managers and all the state were somehow to go away, can it be rebuilt using the data on the left side? So the question is, is if all the managers go away, can the data be rebuilt? Um, yes and no. Uh, that is a little bit implementation specific. Um, I will say that in the case of what we're going to be talking about in a little bit, um, no. The, the managers need to be online. Now, um, they do have state that is written to disk, so they can temporarily go away and come back. But if you were to lose the contents of all their disks, um, then you, you lose the cluster. Now, if you still have one, you can bring up additional ones, and it will copy to the others. And once sufficient have the current copy, then cluster operation can resume. So, but it is just dependent on having a, at least one copy of the state in the manager. Yes, yeah. Okay. You, you, uh, the state of the cluster is, is held by that. If you lose the manager's state, you've lost the cluster. Okay. Okay. So, so that's all good. We've got, we've got a lot of basics here to, to um, have a, a, a cluster that we can put data into, get data out of, know the state of everything. Um, there's just one last problem that we have that we want to talk about which is having one global namespace is, is kind of painful. What if you have, uh, you want to have different storage policies uh, for, for different types of objects? Or what if you have objects that have the same name, but uh, are in fact different from each other? And we can solve this by having a, a, a namespace uh, concept with it as well. Um, 
And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to take our uh, object buckets and we're going to group them into pools or, or gr object groups. Um, and that's where we're going to define things such as the, the replication policy. Um, and the, the naming has to be unique within that uh, group. And the client has to keep track of which group it's using. It's a, S3 calls those groups buckets, right? Yes, they do. S3 calls those buckets. Uh, well, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know the internals of how S3 works. So I can't say that that's how that works. Um, I will we'll go ahead and spoil a little bit of the future part of the presentation. The, uh, the S3 buckets, when you're talking to, to Ceph through the S3 interface, do not map to what this would be. They, that's a different uh, naming underneath or different construct. But for, for the time being, you, you can think of it as a similar idea. And so that leads us to part five, where we have bucket groups. And it looks something like this. We're getting a little crowded here, so removing some description of things. But say, for example, in our, in our green uh, bucket group, our file notes.txt text might map to uh, that one uh, bucket, which then maps to, to different storage servers. But in the, the pink uh, bu uh, bucket group, it maps to a different bucket and different servers. And the, the, the replication uh, policy is different between them, even though in this case I showed just a replication factor of two. Would yes, question. Is still one set of state, or are there two? Is there so the question is if there's one set of state or two with the managers. There is still one set of state. This is one cluster. The managers uh, still operate on this as a whole. Um, we'll, we just, we'll have some kind of identifier to identify the different uh, bu uh, bucket groups. Yes? So, do, um, so in using it, do you have to know about buckets, or is that kind of abstracted away from uh, No, you, the, the client does not have to. Well, OK. The, Client software does have to know about the buckets, but the, uh, with, with some abstractions in the client libraries, uh, you can uh, hide that from the end user or from the application. All right. So this is our hypothetical object store. So let's go through some of the terms again um, and see how they map to Ceph terms. Because what we basically built is, is Ceph. So in our case, objects are, are still the same. Our server in the Ceph uh, terminology is called an object storage daemon, um, or OSD for short. And this is just a, a single process using a, a particular, using a backend data store to store objects. Usually you're going to have one OSD per physical drive. Um, there's no need to, to do a hardware raid because Ceph is taking care of the um, replication and whatnot at a higher level. You don't need to waste additional resources on a hardware or software raid system to do that as well. So if you have multiple drives attached to a single CPU, you would run multiple OSDs? So the question is, if you have multiple drives connected to one system, you would run multiple OSDs? And the answer is yes. Question. Does it also try to optimize reading by so the question is, does it try to optimize reading across the different uh, OSDs? Um, yes and no. Um, the the uh, storage cluster itself does not. Uh, a client can still lay out its data across objects inside of the storage cluster to do so, but the storage cluster itself does not provide that ability. Um, we talked about how earlier data has to be consistent. Um, if you were... Um, reading from multiple OSDs, there's a potential race condition that you have to worry about. And it was decided, you know, it's easier just, or at least I believe they decided it was easier to just punt on that and not do it. Um, so anyways, we, going back to our terminology here, we ha our bucket is equivalent to a Ceph placement group or a PG. Um, and you'll see a little later, the, the placement groups have an identifier that is a um, pool identifier, and then a uh, unique number inside of that pool, um, which down here at the bottom are bucket groups. That's an OS or a, a Ceph pool. Um, so yeah, when referring to a placement group, you, you refer to it as both items together. Finally, for our manager, that's what's called the monitor or the mon. 
Um, and these are the things that you absolutely have to have up and have a um, strict majority of a, or for a quorum to perform operations inside of the cluster. Um, so if you have uh, an even number um, and you lose exactly half of them, then the cluster still goes offline. You have to have a strict majority. So you're probably only going to have an odd number of these. Um, three and five seem to be common uh, situations, maybe seven. Adding more does not necessarily improve the performance of your cluster. So you, adding more than seven really doesn't make sense. So, uh, yes, so, question. So, I mean, these are, these are uh, processes. Would you Correct. turn the monitor on the same machine that may so, have multiple OSDs? Or? So the question is, is, is the monitor just another process? And, and yes, it is. Um, you can run it on the same hosts as your OSDs. And for small clusters, I would say that's, that's an acceptable solution. If you're building a very large cluster, you're going to want to have them on dedicated hardware. Is that for performance reasons or reliability reasons? Um, it's for, for, for both performance and reliability reasons, yeah. fault tolerance. Um, the other thing, too, is um, there are things that potentially block on the monitors as they're writing state. I would definitely recommend using uh, SSDs in them, and particularly a reliable, good quality SSD. Um, you, the last thing you want is to have those things fail. And, um, yes. For the monitors, it does make sense to do like a, a RAID solution. Yes, for the monitors, it does make a lot of sense to do a RAID solution for their storage, because there is not the built-in redundancy of that on a, on a host basis. You could go without it, and just whenever one dies, you rebuild that monitor. Um, but the the monitors can be a little touchy when it comes to to cluster performance when they change states. And so you want to avoid them changing states if you can. Um, the other crazy thing is that these concepts also kind of match to OpenStack Swift. If you've ever used uh, Swift, uh, the same basic ideas pretty closely apply to it. Uh, your objects are still the same. They call uh, their object or their server an object server. The buckets are loosely or pretty equivalent to what's called a partition in Swift. Um, your manager is what's called the ring in Swift, which is the the files that control the the consistent hashing that um, Swift does, um, and the the files that are associated with that uh, hashing ring. And then your the bucket group is one thing that. There isn't so much a direct correlation, but there are still storage policies you can define in Swift. And so even though we, we, we talked through a hypothetical object store in terms of Ceph, the same basic concepts can still be seen in, in other distributed storage systems. All right, now let's start talking about some actual Ceph specifics. Um, first off, two big terms, um, Rados and Crush. So RADOS stands for the Reliable Autonomic Distributed Object Store. And this is the actual, or this is the storage cluster as a whole. Um, you'll, it, there will uh, frequently be references to RADOS in the client libraries and other things. And that's really, this is talking to the storage cluster as a whole and performing the operations like we described uh, in our hypothetical object store. Um, crush is where the magic comes in. This is called the controlled replication under scalable hashing. Uh, there, so for both of these, there's papers that were done as part of Sage Weil's uh, <coughs> graduate work. I don't remember which degree. Um, but crush is, is how we're going to do the mapping of a placement group to a set of storage servers. Um, and this is what allows for data to be defined to be dif in different locations based on various storage policies. Uh, it also controls you know, whenever the, the state of the cluster changes, how it changes, uh, and the math associated with that. Um, and we can define, for example, things such as how many copies are made. Um, there's two forms of replication. I shouldn't call it replication, but two forms of uh, redundancy that Ceph currently supports. One is just a straight replicated uh, object style where you know, we just make multiple copies. There is also an erasure coded uh, mechanism 
where um, it will take the object, feed it through an erasure coding, get an, a number of objects out of that that it will store across the cluster, and it has to get a certain number of them back to be able to reconstruct the object. Uh, that one gets into some more computer science theory stuff that we don't need to go into right now. So anyways, so these are our uh, two big terms to be aware of. And overall, the Ceph architecture looks pretty much like this. Down at the bottom, we have our object store, and that was Rados. And this is the, the storage cluster. All our, our OSDs, our monitors, the placement groups, and the data in them is this object store layer at the bottom. Then we have various clients on top. And you can see this first one here, we have libRados, which is uh, a C library uh, for reading and writing uh, objects from the object store. And uh, applications can use it directly. It actually has a, a relative, or a pretty nice API for interacting with um, from C, and there are bindings for other languages as well. Uh, two other examples of, of, of applications that are built on top of Libratos are the Rados Gateway and what's called RBD, or the Rados Block Device. Rados Gateway is something that provides an S3-like interface. Um, it also provides a Swift like interface as well. So if you've used either of those object stores, there's a decent chance you can just point your application at the Rados gateways for a Ceph cluster, and you won't have to make further modifications to your code. There's still some possibility, but the, they implement a large portion of the APIs from those different providers, and uh, they usually can be used just out of the box. Um, RBD. Um, is a type of a, a virtual disk drive that's built on top of uh, the Rados cluster. So if you think to, to VMs and their virtual disks, usually they have some kind of file on a file system somewhere and, and they do mappings between the, the guest or between the, the VM virtual disk and the actual uh, mapping of blocks on the file system. Well, RBD does a similar thing. It will take your, uh, a, a virtual block device and split it up into chunks for megabytes by default, and it will store each of those as an independent object inside of the Ceph cluster. And it has you know, some ways to automatically generate what object uh, is being used and uh, write to and read from those objects in the Ceph cluster. Finally, the last one is um, CephFS which uh, does provide a POSIX-like file system abstraction on top of a Ceph cluster. Um, this is one that um, has, they've always said, you know, there be dragons here. Um, they, for a long time, it was not considered production ready. Um, as of middle of last year, roughly, it, it's usable and production ready, or at least it's, it's not likely to lose your data as long as you work with a few restrictions. Um, they have some, some things. It, it's designed so that it can scale in many different ways. And some of those uh, ways that it can do it cause or have you know, potential pitfalls with them. And uh, it's not fully tested and, and fully vetted. So as long as you stick to a, a limited subset of its features, it should work. I've not used it myself, though, so I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. So the question was, is if there's a, a, a FISC for it, and, and someone said there is now. Um, I know there has been to extensive talk about a, a FISC utility uh, over the past couple of years, and, and lots of work done on that. I don't know the state myself, so. So, anyways. Uh, let's see here. So the, the big thing here is that um, to, to put data into and get data out of the object store, you need a client or a client library that knows the specifics of the Ceph cluster. Um, at a minimum, it needs to know how to take the variables of how the, the cluster is laid out and be able to compute where data needs to go. Um, there are other things associated with it as well that um, yeah, a, a, a client that is aware of that uh, needs to be used. 
Um, and we, we talked through lots of different situations where there are clients for it or applications that use clients. Um, I went through a lot of these already. Uh, talking about RBD real quick, there are two forms of a RBD client. There's one that's built, built into the mainline Linux kernel, and then there's a separate user space one. Um, the one that's built into the mainline kernel, um, it has a slower development cycle than the uh, user space one. Uh, and so it doesn't necessarily support all the features that the user space one does. Um, but you don't have, act, using it doesn't require going through some user space application on the host either. Um, on the other hand, there's the user space one. And this is what applications such as QEMU um, or uh, RBD, NBD will use. Uh, are many people here familiar with TGT? So not really. So TGT is an iSCSI target that you can use to uh, export some storage mechanism as, as an iSCSI target. Uh, and there is actually a back end for TGT to use the, the Rados block device as a back end for it. So if you have a client or application that talks iSCSI, you, you, you can build a, kind of an iSCSI proxy using TGT so that the, your iSCSI client can connect to, to it and then TGT will talk to the, the Ceph cluster on behalf of the client. So, yes? So is RBD generally considered production ready? RBD definitely is production ready. That is what 99% of the use case we use it for uh, in my job. So the question was is if RBD is production ready. Uh, and yes, it, it definitely is. No dragons, uh, huh? huh? No dragons. No, no dragons. Uh, the, the Rados gateway, too, is, is considered production ready. Um, there are a lot of uh, shops that use the Rados gateway um, as if it were an S3 or Swift uh, server uh, so that they can kind of have mobility between different um, object storage systems, whether or not they want to use AWS or, or their own thing or something else. So uh, yes, the, the Rados gateway is also production ready. The only one that's really there may be Dragons is, is CephFS, and, and it, it's getting there. Swift was an OpenStack? Oh, yes. Sure. Yes. Swift is a, a, a project under the OpenStack umbrella. It's kind of the redheaded stepchild of OpenStack. Um, it originally came out of Rackspace as a, what was the name of their product? Rackspace had a, had a, has a product very similar to, to S3. And when Rackspace and NASA started the OpenStack project, NASA contributed Nova. Rackspace contributed Swift, and those were the two projects that, that started the OpenStack ecosystem. Yes? In your opinion, when do you think it will be ready? The, when, that CephFS will be ready? Yeah. So the question is, when do I think CephFS will be ready? Um, like I said, it's, it should be ready right now if you're willing to live with some limitations. Read the documentation about what those limitations are. The rest of it, I don't know. Um, they did just uh, a couple weeks ago have their Kraken release. I didn't see anything in the release notes about uh, advances they'd made on, on the CephFS production status. They're currently working on their, they just started work on the, um, their next long-term release. They, so Ceph does releases every six months. Um, the spring one they consider an LTS and they support it through two release cycles. The other one they only support through one release cycle. Um, there, there may be quite a bit that's going into their next LTS release that I'm not aware of, but I, and I admit I haven't been following it all that well. Um, I, I know it's still a, an area of active development, though. So, all right. Any other questions so far? All right then. Let's get to some demo type items. To start with, though, unfortunately, it's more slides. Um, so one of the most basic things you want to be able to do when you have a Ceph cluster is be able to get the status of what the cluster is. Uh, and so you can use the Ceph status uh, command to get this. And you'll get an output like this minus the colors. Colors added so I can explain what, what's in there. Uh, the first one in green is you have health OK. Uh, that says everything is all right with the cluster. Life is good. Um, if it's uh, not, then it will say health worn. Um, 
Yes, okay. yes. But I say there's there is a third one that I have not experienced myself on a production system, and so I couldn't remember what it was. But yes, health crit. Uh, I believe in that state, the cluster is offline. You, you basically. At least some placement groups aren't available. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you have you have some data that is unavailable. You're not going to be able to do all operations. Um, health warn means that the cluster is still operating, but there's something in a bad state that if something else goes wrong, you may be uh, in a bad state or be offline for, for various things. So health okay is what you want to see there. Um, below that in, in yellow, and this is kind of spread across a few lines, you can see the list of monitors uh, in the cluster and what their status is. Uh, on the top line in yellow, you can see there's the list of all, in this case, I had three monitors. Um, and then the line below it over to the side, you can see that there is currently a quorum of all three of those. Uh, if one were to be down, uh, you would still see it in the list of monitors, but it would not be listed in the quorum. Um, the next uh, line in blue, we can see what the state of the various OSDs in the cluster is. In this case, we have eight OSDs. Uh, and since we're at health okay, that means all of them are up and in. So there, there's two different uh, states that can change here between two different values. The first one where it says up here, the other state is down. Um, this is basically whether or not the OSD is communicating, is running and communicating with the rest of the cluster. Um, for in, the other potential state is out. Um, and what this means is that this storage daemon is part of the, um, the placement maps that are used to, to map placement groups to storage servers, to OSDs. Um, so you can see right here, they're all up and they're all in. If one of my OSDs were to go down, that the up would, would decrement to seven up, but it would stay at eight in for a period of time. Um, and that's because the, the, the cluster is by default going to give uh, a couple minutes for that OSD to come back before it start, tries to do.
let's come back to our slides now. So we went through some of that. You got to experience what it takes to actually do a little bit of troubleshooting with, a, with the Ceph cluster. Uh, that was unexpected, but hey, useful information. Uh, though, uh, if you do have a production cluster, it's very easy to, to be like, OK, now what am I supposed to be doing again? So uh, my recommendation is if you do intend to use um, Ceph uh, in a production environment, you're definitely going to want to take time uh, in advance and break it in various ways so that when something does break, you know what, what needs to be done. Uh, it's, it's not the same as, say, if a hardware RAID fails and just replace the drive and tell the controller to do its thing. Um, there may be, may be items that you need to do related to it. So, yes? Uh, so the question is ways to break a cluster to, to test things out. Uh, obviously, uh, yeah, obviously, I mean, ki kill an OSD. Um, just stopping one like what I just did is one good way. Um, you you, you plug, pull a plug on uh, servers and also switches involved. Um, there, I have some stuff uh, at the end about architecture and designing for a Ceph cluster. Network is an important part. Test network failures. Uh, you can try silly, crazy things like putting some IP tables drop rules between uh, different things and see how it reacts. Um, stop monitors. Restart monitors. Uh, see what the behavior is with, with those failing. Um, actually de destroy the data on an OSD and, and go through the steps that it takes to remove an OSD from the cluster and what it takes to add a new OSD to the cluster. Um, let's see. Talked about network, uh, IP tables, let's see. Those are the big ones that I can think of, yeah. Reinstall the server. Yeah, re reinstall, yeah. Blow a system away and reinstall it and, see, and, and go through that procedure. Uh, reboot a host also. Yeah, reboot a host, yep. Another hand here. You said destroy the data, you mean like write garbage to the, the underlying block device or yeah. something? Yeah, so if like. If you were to do that, does the client have, does it check would it detect that? One? So, so if you did, if you destroyed a bunch of data underneath the OSD, um, depending on how you do it, the OSD might immediately detect the I/O error and, and immediately exit. In which case, the clients will get an update in a moment saying, "Hey, this OSD is not there anymore," and they'll proceed in a failure scenario. Um, if you, it, you actually you just corrupt the data, but there's nothing. So, so, so if you go through it and like twiddle bits inside of objects, uh, that is something that you can test. Uh, the, so you're, you're intentionally creating data inconsistencies. Um, so find an object, do that, and then run a, a deep scrub on the placement group that that object is in and see how it behaves because you will see the behavior then. Uh, it will get marked as inconsistent and, and try to go through recovery. Um, Depending on how your storage policies are defined, it may not be able to, to do recovery on its own in that situation, which requires you having to do something to fix the inconsistencies. Um, the only way I can really think of that you, where the cluster wouldn't be able to handle that on its own is if you have a situation where you have, um, say your, your, your replication factor is an even number, and you set your min size to half of that. Um, in that situation, you can kind of get a split brain type scenario where two OSDs don't agree with two other OSDs on what the contents of the data should be, and it can't resolve that, that conflict on its own. That's if you corrupt the data on up to half. Yeah, the right? yeah. If you just twiddle bits on one, the, it would the, that up. the most common situation for that is actually if you have your replication factor set at two with a min size of one. Or actually, if, you're, if your replication size is two, if either one of them gets corrupt, the cluster cannot uh, reconcile that difference on its own. So I would strongly recommend, uh, even though in, in my, the, our hypothetical object store, I use the example of two copies, I would strongly recommend against two copies in a production cluster. Uh, three is a minimum with the, the min right sizes two, in my opinion. So. Which is also the default. Yes, which is, which is also the default. Any other questions so far? Yes. The Ceph 
command line tool, does it have to run on one of the monitors? Or? Uh, it can run anywhere where it's installed and has sufficient details to talk to the cluster. So you can run it locally and just give an IP address to one of the monitors? Yes, you, you can run the Ceph client on, uh, on a local workstation or, or something else as long as it can communicate with um, the monitors as well as the OSDs and has sufficient um, details and sufficient auth tokens to do so, it can do that. Um, where in our, the situation I have at work, we have the Ceph utility installed on our monitors, our, our storage servers. We also have it installed on all of our, our um, like hypervisors. And so even though the hypervisors aren't actually part of the storage cluster, we can still query state and perform operations on the cluster from the hypervisors. Is it really require root? So the, the, the question is, is, does the Ceph utility require root? Technically, no. Um, the, the utility needs to be able to read the auth token and the config file uh, of how to talk to the, the cluster. In my situation here, that auth token is the admin token and only readable by root. But you can create user tokens and distribute them, and then users can, or you can communicate using a non-root user for the command line. The, the, the Ceph command here uh, does nothing with local state on the system. All it's doing is communicating with the, set, with the cluster, getting state and, and information from it, and performing operations in memory. So other than reading the config file and the, and the auth token, uh, that's the only reason why root would be needed. Which is the case here. Which is the case, yeah. I mean, if I, you can see here, it's actually this, uh, my, uh, to auth token is stored in this file. Um, and so that's only, well, root can read it, but you know, the Ceph user could as well. So, all right, let's uh, get to some examples of actually reading and writing data from the cluster. So if uh, we want to use the basic low level uh, interfaces to the, the storage cluster, we can use the Rados command uh, line or the, the libratos um, APIs. Uh, the Rados command line tool is just a thin wrapper around um, those APIs. Um, so for example, we can do a put and we give it the object name and what, where we want to read the data from. We can pull one where, again, we define the object name and where we want to write that data to. Uh, we can do an LS. And uh, this last one here, uh, list OMAP values, that lets you get access to the the additional attributes that an object can have. Kind of like how I said, with file systems, there's extended attributes. This is how you would get access to some of those as well. So let's uh, come back to our command line here. So um, in my directory here, I have this nice notes.txt file that we've been, we're using through our uh, demonstration earlier. Um, let me do this first. So I'm adding this p-p option, which lets me specify a pool that I want to perform the operation on. And I'm actually going to do an ls first, because I don't think I cleaned this out from last time. And yep, I didn't. Um, so there is that notes.txt uh, object that is already in the cluster. One note about the ls command, though, the Rados ls command. Um, the, the only uh, listing that there is is by going and asking each placement group in the pool what objects do you have, which results in potentially directory lookups on a lot of different storage servers uh, or across your entire cluster. And, and if you have a lot of objects, that can take a very long time to complete. Um, so I would only recommend it as a debugging in development type tool. I wouldn't recommend actually running that on a production cluster with millions of objects. So um, I'm actually going to See, I think this is the right command here. I'm going to get rid of uh, that file. OK, so we have nothing uh, in this pool. And actually, I forgot to show this one off earlier. There's the cephdf command that you can use to get a, an idea of how much space is being used in the cluster. Um, the big thing here is these are all the different pools that I have defined um, and how much is in them. So like, for example, this test pool, I currently have no objects in it, and it's not using any size. But um, these other uh, uh, pools, like, for example, 
This one has 127 objects. I don't know how it's using zero bytes. Uh, this one has five objects and is using a couple K, etc. So, and then up here at the top, this is the total overall usage. So I have 119 gigabytes available, uh, 391 raw used, which uh, I don't remember what m the size or the replication factor I've set is. So it's either I'm using roughly 100 or, or roughly 150 to 200 of, uh, of usable storage space. So let's go ahead and so let's put, oh, uh, test pool, put notes.txt, notes.txt. So in this case, it's going to write that file in there. If we do the ls again, we can see that it's there. Um, and we can actually now do um, a git on this. And let's write it into a temp file. And now we can md5 sum these two. And voila, we had the same data out that we put in. So we, we, it, the cluster did what, what was advertised. Um, the other thing that we can do is uh, going back to, uh, I said, uh, hold on on this, this map function. Let's take a look at that now. So we can do a, let's see, actually, I need to look at my history to find this one. Uh, Yeah, so here we go. Um, Ceph OST map, test pool, and notes. So the OST map uh, utility um, will connect to the cluster, find out what the state of cluster is, and then perform the mapping of the object you're specifying and the pool you're specifying and tell you which placement group and which OSDs that that object would, would be stored on. So we can go ahead and run this here. And you can see uh, for test pool, uh, the notes.txt object would map to um, PG, and then it's actually this one here, 11.c, and there is an upset and an acting set. Um, these are the same when uh, the cluster's in a same, in a healthy state. If the pla if the placement group is having to move between nodes for various reasons, the acting set is where the data currently is. The upset is where the data is moving to. So you can see right here, it's stored on OSDs 1 and 7. Uh, OSD 1 is commute because it's already on this node that we're on. So let's just do this real quick. Uh, Ceph OSD, Ceph dash 1. So I'm using a little bit of magic of the, the internals of how Ceph stores things here. Um, if I do a, a look in this directory, which maps to that placement group, we can see I have this notes.txt with some extra data. I'm actually not sure what this extra bit of data is, so don't ask. But if I uh, MD5 sum this, uh, one current 11 dot, dot c underscore head slash that, you can see that MD5 sum matches what's here. So it hasn't done anything with the data itself in the, in the process of storing the object. This is true with a replicated storage, or a, uh, uh, storage pool. If you use an erasure one where it's doing the fancy math for the redundancy, that would not be the case. It would have actually modified the, the contents there. So, so yeah. Seth uses some host file system underneath to store the objects. It's not so, using raw block access. Yeah, so the comment is that Ceph uses a file system underneath. That is correct for the moment. Um, uh, right now, the only really supported file system underneath is XFS. Um, they did used to support ext3, but they ran into some problems with um, long uh, extended attribute names. And so they've, they've deprecated ext4 support underneath. Uh, they originally wanted to use uh, ButterFS, BTRFS, whatever you want to call it. Um, that one is still uh, marked as experimental. You can try it if you want, but uh, I, I, yeah, I, I haven't found uh, a need for it myself. Um, and actually, in the case of uh, RBD, where you're, where you're rewriting 
or, or changing an object a, a lot, um, ButterFS actually has a performance degradation over time yeah. because it's doing snapshotting every time there's a write. So. Huh? Yeah, XFS works pretty well with lots of little files. So. Now the the caveat to that is that they are actually working on their own um, direct on the block device storage system called Blue Store. Um, that is in a tech preview status, I believe. Uh, last I heard, they were hoping to have it marked as production ready for the L release that happens in sometime in the April May time frame. At least in theory, happens then. Um, but it's still yet to be seen whether or not that, that is actually the case. The nice thing with uh, Blue Store is that it removes some of the overhead associated with um, write operations. Like um, here, um, if we look on this system, you can see that for each of these uh, OSDs, they're mounted uh, on SDB B1 and C1. But if I look on the in my partition table, there's actually a, a second uh, partition on each of them. And it, Ceph actually uses this block device directly as a journal um, for, for writes happening to the cluster. And so every write first gets written to the journal in its entirety and then gets flushed to the backing store later. And so in situations like this, you're actually doing two writes, at least two writes on, on each of the drive for every write that the client is doing. Blue store is supposed to get around that. Is that an XFS feature? I'm not familiar with XFS. No, this is not. It's, it's, it's a Ceph specific feature. You can do other things too, like such as storing that journal on another device. Um, one of the three clusters that I mentioned we have in production, we actually store that journal on several uh, NVMe flash drives. And so with that, we're able to do, Ceph is able to do the, the write to the NVMe flash drive and respond to the client very quickly. And then at some point in the future, it flushes to the, to the hard drive. So the question is if the journal is used if another node is down. So the journal is the journal is used regardless of what of communication with other OSDs. So the, the actual file storage underneath an OSD is not known to the rest of the cluster. So you can actually have OSDs with different file systems underneath, with different journal configurations, with uh, you could use Blue Store on some and, and XFS on others. And the cluster isn't, as a whole is not going, going to care. You still have to worry about it from a, a uh, performance and a redundancy standpoint, um, particularly if you're using Blue, or Blue Store right now and, and the um, potential for data loss associated with it, since it's relatively untested, uh, you'll want to plan accordingly. Um, but yes, it's, it's, not a, it's not a feature of the file system or anything underneath. I saw a couple hands back here. So the question is, if you can append to or modify an object, yes, you can. Uh, the, the libraries have calls for doing writes in the middle of an object. Uh, and I believe appending to is just you know set your index at the end and start and continue writing. Uh, consult documentation on how to actually do that. The command line tools are, are somewhat limited in how that can be done. But the, the APIs do allow for it, yes. Was there another hand? No? OK. All right, so let's see. We talked about mapping, storing, and getting. OK, let's go back to the slides here. We covered most of this. I'm, I'm not going to cover the OMAP vowels. I, I have done that in the past, but we're running low on time. Um, the next sample is uh, RBD. Um, you can use the RBD tool to um, manipulate uh, RBD images. So if you want to have, um, for example, a, a KVM guest that is using the Ceph cluster uh, for its file storage. Um, you first have to, to, to create an RBD volume, which really just does a few simple operations to, to create uh, some information about uh, the volume. And uh, it doesn't actually use the space up front. It only uses the space in the cluster as the VMs use the space in their virtual drive. Um, you can use the map and unmap to, to disconnect the, the kernel client from the, the Ceph cluster. Um, 
Here are some ways that you, you could specify it if you were to, to run a QMU command directly or uh, if you were using libvert to uh, define how to, to connect to, SF, the, to the Ceph cluster using RBD. So if we come back here, um, let's clear this. So if we do a sudo RBD, I'm going to go ahead and specify the pool again. If you don't specify the pool to the RBD command, it assumes the RBD pool. So you can see I, I have a few um, test uh, volumes in here. I can do an info on RBD test, and it gives me several bits of information related to it, like, for example, that it is one gigabyte in size in 256 objects. So that means I'm using a four megabyte object size, which is the default. Um, and you can see here, that's, it defines it here. Um, the, the format, um, I believe the default format changed to two in Joule. Before that, the default format was one. Um, the format two does provide several additional things. Um, here, the only feature being added is layering. Let me take a look. If we do it on RBD test three, you can see there's additional uh, flags being used. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep into these. Uh, you can go consult the documentation as to what they actually mean. But uh, I can do I can do a map on say RBD test. And you can see it says I have dev RBD zero now, and I have a, a you know virtual block device now that has a partition table on it. Looks looks and acts just like a regular block device in Linux. Uh, to stop this, I can just do rbd unmap, uh, and then you give it the the uh, volume name, and it should be gone now. Um, the one downside to this is if I try to map this rbd test three that has the additional features, this fails, saying that it's not that there are features being used that are not supported by the kernel client. Um, in this case, you could use the um, RBD NBD tool. And what this does is creates a user space process that acts as a proxy between the kernel NBD client and the Ceph cluster. Um, so here it says I have NBD0. Um, I don't have anything on this. this uh, uh, volume yet, but um, and if we look here, you can see we actually have a user space process that is still running, and so as the the kernel tries to use this NBD zero device, it's actually passing uh, commands through the NBD protocol to this user space process, and then this user space process is connecting to the Ceph cluster on on behalf of the kernel. Oh, uh, this I think you give it. I had problems with this in other demos. I'm not entirely sure how to unmap it. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to stop it. Um, and, oh, well, it would help if I spell it. Well, let's see. No, I did that right. It's an MBD space device. Uh, the man page? Yeah. Yeah, map MBD device. Well, I'm curious as to what the two different things are supposed to mean. You probably have it backwards. It was MBD test three and then the device. Yeah, maybe. Huh. Nope. Whatever, we won't worry about it for now. Demo gremlins. So anyways, this is actually the, the use case that um, we use uh, at work for me with the, the three production clusters is we, we run hundreds of VMs using RBD as the, the backing store the, for the VMs. Yes? On that config, are those the uh, monitors that you're pointing to? So the question is on the configuration, what are the IP addresses that are in there? Those would be the addresses of the monitors, correct. 
in general, do the clients, whether it's Libvirt or any of the other clients, they talk to the monitors, right? So the question is, do the, do the clients talk to the monitors? The clients talk to, to all parts of the storage cluster. They talk to the monitors to get information about cluster state. And then when it comes to the actual data operations, they talk directly to the OSDs themselves. So the monitors are not in the data path, which is part of how Ceph gets its performance benefits. It, it removes them as a, a single bottleneck in the system. Uh, I should say, CephFS does modify that in a little way. It does require an additional daemon called the metadata server, or the MDS. Um, one of those restrictions right now is that you can only have one active MDS for a, a, a won't destroy your data file system. Um, so if you're using CephFS in that way, it, you do still have that restriction. Um, but it, it, the, the overall architecture does allow for, for multiple MDSs. There's just lots of potential corner cases and whatnot. It's just not tested as well. Um, and so that's why it's, um, why it's still marked as there be dragons, so. All right, so that's RBD. Last thing to briefly show, and then we'll do this one really quick, um, is Rados Gateway. And I have to admit, this is the extent of my knowledge of using Ceph with the Rados Gateway and as a S3 slash Swift uh, interface. Um, I had to, to figure this out for this demo. Um, but let's see. Uh, so we can do a, an LS on the test bucket here. Uh, we, we already have a notes.text in our, uh, our bucket. We can do like, for example, Let's put it into a different object name. You can see it, it took it. We have it. Um, we can do a, a git on the same thing. Um, and we can MD5 summit, and we see this it's the same MD5 summits before. So this S3CMD was a, um, There's a tool for, for interacting with, with Amazon S3. Uh, I did have to make a couple config changes to point it to my Rados gateway, but uh, I can use it just as if it was AWS now. So essentially turning into a drop-in replacement. Yes, it, it's essentially being turned into a drop-in replacement for S3. Um, uh, if I look at my S3 CFG file, uh, here were the big two places that I made a change. I told the host and the host bucket are, are different from the default Amazon ones. I had to do some other funky stuff with DNS to get wildcarding to work right so that when the client looked things up, it, it looked them up properly but, and got connected to, to the, the Rados gateway. But once you do that, yes, it works. So, All right. Well, we've gotten to, to the end. There, there's, been, there's been lots of questions as we've gone along, but any other questions? Does life have intrinsic meaning? Huh? Does, oh, does life have intrinsic meaning? Um, I will point you to uh, a priest of your chosen religion or something like that. I don't know. Uh, question in the back. So for you, if, the question is, if you want to use, build a large NFS system, would you use Gluster or Ceph? Um, the answer I would have right now is probably neither. Um, the, with both situations, you're probably going to do something where you create a volume that acts as a block device, create a file system on top of it, and then ex mount that file system on your NFS server and then export that through NFS. Um, and that will work with either one. Uh, I don't know that one has an advantage over the other if you have experience with one versus the other. So just whichever storage system you have experience with. You know, um, the, uh, the dragons you could maybe do SFFS as a replacement for some NFS. So there, and, and I was just about to say, if you're, if you're willing to, to tame the dragons, um, there is actually a backend for NFS Ganesha, which is a user space NFS server. 
for it to use CephFS natively in the back end. So you, you can run the user space application for NFS Ganesha. It talks to the Ceph cluster and provides NFS to the clients. Um, but that does involve using CephFS directly. Um, so you, you have the, the pitfalls associated with that. What I've seen from here, Ceph seems to be easier to add and remove nodes. Yeah. So I've not actually used Gluster myself. Uh, so I can't speak to how easy or hard it is to add or remove nodes. The, Ceph is very easy to add and remove nodes. The documentation relates to Gluster FS is essentially Aaron Toponce's blog. Yes, yes. <laughs> Aaron Toponce has, some, has a great uh, blog series about Gluster, particularly with NFS, or uh, ZFS. Yes? Do you build your Ceph clusters as a single, uh, let's say, appliance that you say, this in the last five years it's been size, or do you like to have a cluster that you expand over so the, the question was around capacity management with a Ceph cluster and how we at Bluehost have built our clusters. Um, we've taken both approaches where we have, where we start with a minimal set and we expand it over time. We've also taken an approach where we build it basically entirely up front and leave it. Um, I can't say that one's better than the other. Um, I, it probably depends on what your, um, capital resources are when you build it. Um, the, the building it up front is kind of nice because you know you, what your capacity is. You, you can do some uh, testing and, and know what the performance characteristics of it are going to be up front. Whereas if you're expanding it over time, that changes. Um, I guess one other thing to note about that too is um, Ceph is not necessarily the greatest about distributing data nicely. Uh, let's come back here. Uh, so we can do the Ceph DF tree. Oh, wait. Uh, that's DDF tree. And we can see what the space utilization across the different um, nodes are. Um, and these are actually pretty closely, uh, pretty close to each other in balance. But as you get to you know, clusters that are uh, that have you know millions and millions of objects and are getting and OSTs are getting close to full. It, it you see that it doesn't distribute things anywhere close to perfectly. Um, so that's something to be aware of too. When you when you build it out, you're going to need you're going to need to build excess storage capacity than what you think you will need from a usability standpoint. You want to be able to have storage capacity online for failures, and also it's not the greatest at distributing it evenly. Um, in in uh, my production clusters, um, even with me doing a lot of tweaking weighting values, I still have OSDs that are, for example, 75% full in one cluster and ones that are 40% full in the same cluster. So um, definitely plan for, for overhead in your capacity planning because it will get used. And I guess while we're talking about that, I do have a slide that's a little bit about architecture and, and building one. Uh, we talked about don't, don't bother with hardware RAID earlier. Um, use reliable and known hardware. Um, the, the story I have here is that the two of the clusters that we built, um, during the initial build, we used 40 gigabit NICs in the servers because we didn't really have a good idea of what the performance characteristics were going to be. Um, that proved to be way overkill. Um, and we actually ran into, we still don't know what caused this. We ran into a network bug. Um, and the only thing that reliably fixed it was we replaced all the 40 gig NICs with 10 gig NICs. <laughs> so. You couldn't fit 40 gig. Well, I, 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 I <laughs> We don't know for sure what it was. I mean, we tried multiple versions of the of the 40 gig NIC driver. We tried versions of its firmware. We did try different kernel versions. We, we swapped cables. We did different switch yeah. firmwares. It was it was some weird network gremlin that we could not trace down. Um, so and the only th huh? You mind sharing which NIC it was? Uh, the Intel XL710DA2 or QDA2. 
so the the Intel 710 dual 40 gig um, QSFP NIC. And we replaced them with Intel um, X520 DA2s. So the, the, t the, the 10 gig dual port SFP plus that has been around forever, it seems, and has a lot more mileage on it than the, the Intel 40s do. Now, I, I, sh I should say, it's, you know, I, I still couldn't actually pinpoint the problem on the 40 gig NICs, other than the fact that the only time that the problem consistently went away and we were not able to, to, to twiddle the bug again was after we replaced those NICs. It may have been something else that replacing them just kind of caused, but it, it goes back to use something that you're familiar with, something that you have mileage on. Um, for example, if you're using SSDs for your journals or you're doing it, the SS, or the cache tiering that it that Ceph supports, use good SSDs for those, like enterprise class SSDs. We tried the consumer grade and it didn't work out well for us. Um, the other big thing is know your use case. If you're going to be doing something like RBD, the, the clients in that situation inherently kind of assume really low latency on the operations because, you know, latency to a hard drive is usually less than latency across a network. Um, so you're going to want to, to go with a, a higher performance profile on your cluster. If you're doing nothing but, but Rados Gateway, just throw massive amounts of hard drives at it and, and put 40 drives per node or something like that. Because um, in that case, the, the latency doesn't matter and you're not really doing overwrites or modifies of objects all that often. So consider your, your, your use case up front uh, because that, the way you, you build your cluster and architect it, uh, could, uh, the way you do it will have a big impact on, on the performance afterwards. Any other questions? Yes. Where is Ceph in the space? Is it the state of the art? How does it compare to other objects? How, how, so the question is, how does Ceph compare with the general state of storage right now? Uh, I would say it's still one of the more advanced ones. Um, the number of object stores that I have dealt with is, well, more than most, but it's still relatively limited. Um, I, I think it's definitely much more advanced than, than OpenStack Swift. I would not even consider using Swift myself at the moment for anything because Ceph uh, pretty readily fills that, that uh, requirement as well. Um, there are some, some project, there are products um, from commercial vendors. Uh, I can't really speak to them because uh, I've not used them. I guess the other two things that you might compare Ceph to are Gluster and Luster. Uh, I've not used either directly, so I can't say for sure. Uh, I would say Ceph is definitely more advanced than Gluster. Um, Gluster also has a bit of simplicity to it. Um, so, you know, it can go either way there, depending on the use case. Um, I have not done Luster at all, so I can't talk to it. Like, are there other questions? For S3, if, uh, if that's the object store you're wanting, uh, like an S3 replacement, I'm actually working on that right now. There are lots of different options. Some of them are terrible. Some of them are good that have bad support. Um, and it's kind of evolving pretty rapidly, I think. Ceph is a little bit behind the S3 compatibility and features of some of the leaders, but the technology is probably better than most. Um, if I could get uh, Red Hat or somebody to support it decently, I'd probably choose it. But uh, mm -hmm. worrying about the support piece uh, for a production thing is uh, kind of the only hesitation I would have about supporting that. So just for the audio recording, the, the comment from the audience was that there are other things that have better API compatibility with S3, um, but the thought is Swift maybe, or uh, Ceph is probably more uh, mature on the back end, at not, as a, not as advanced as the other options on the back end, but more mature. Um, and there's concerns about support uh, for, for Ceph. Uh, that is one thing that um, at, with where I work, um, 
we were running into some problems and, and we, we wanted a, an outside party to consult with on Ceph. And so we, we found uh, a company to do that. And I actually have a, uh, a contractor in Amsterdam that I consult with occasionally on uh, architectural troubleshooting, debugging type things related to our, our Ceph clusters. Um, both, I, I know both Red Hat and Canonical do um, end user support for Ceph clusters. Uh, of course, under their own set of architecture guidelines, uh, you have to, to ma match their requirements on how the cluster is built and deployed for them to support you on it. But they, they will do that. They do a, uh, they charge by capacity of your cluster. So uh, as, as you build a bigger cluster, they charge more. So um, though with, you know, various differences between their actual, their actual billing structures that I probably shouldn't share. Um, so yeah, any other questions or comments? Yes. Um, do you know how well Ceph handles the split brain scenarios? And how so the question is how well does Ceph handle the split brain scenarios? When it comes to the monitors, like I said, strict majority is required, so split brain isn't really a possibility. Um, the only case I can really, that I can practically think of in a split brain scenario for anything in Ceph is if you have uh, a pool where you define the, the replication factor as two, the size of the, the pool is two, and um, one of your copies got out of date from the others. Um, so that's the only real split brain scenario I can think of that's even possible with Ceph. Even with the multiple data center type scenarios? Even with the multiple data center type scenarios, because if you're doing a, a replication factor of larger than two, even if the, data, the other data center is across the world, it will still wait for that operation to complete before the client uh, is acknowledged to, have, to the right being successful. So that's another thing to consider when you're, when you're building your, your cluster and how you're laying out your data. Um, because writes have to be successful to, to so many parts and uh, to so many storage servers and where those storage servers are located, that latency might come into play. Are there, I had a question, are there any good tools for like, statistic tracking, like how much uh, in and out of one of the gateways an object might be using, like if you, like for companies that bill based on usage or something? So the question is, is uh, Yeah, so the, the question is um, metrics and accounting for uh, data going into and out of the cluster. Um, I, I don't know on, on the Rados gateway side of things. So that one, which if you're going to do like external building is probably going to be related to that. As far as monitoring metrics within the cluster itself, um, I'm actually using Collect D with a Ceph plugin. And I have Collect D then shove all the metrics that it's pulling out of the OSDs into a Graphite system. And I use Graphite for tracking it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are various other things. Um, the post or the, the, the log analysis after the fact is not really something that uh, I think would be feasible with Ceph. Because to get the logs necessary for that, you have to turn up things so much that your logs just inundate everything. So. Um, as far as the, the billing aspect, I'm, I'm guessing there is something related to Rados Gateway that does let you get those accounting features. Um, as far as the cluster itself, it would be very, in, inside of the cluster, talking about just, if you're looking at just the context of the OSDs or just the context of the managers, you wouldn't have sufficient data to be able to do accounting type metric gathering. Yeah, I'm just curious, it presents different challenges. Mm-hmm. But, but there, the, the various daemons inside of Ceph, the OSDs and the monitors, they have a massive amount of metrics available out of them for, for monitoring purposes. Um, each of my storage servers, which has um, between 9 and 14 OSDs per node, uh, will generate between three and 6,000 metrics a minute in graphite. So. There's a lot of metrics. There, there's a lot of data available if you're if you're wanting to look at it. And there are there are a variety of of uh, ways you can can put those into other systems for analysis. 
graphite is just what I know and and was useful. So. So, uh, yeah, I haven't had to yet. Um, I mean, we, we, we keep track of that on our systems because we're running a bunch of VMs and knowing how many IOs a second is happening on the clusters is a very important metric for us to be tracking. So um, we, we do do that and we have a lot of data that's built up over a year now. Uh, so it's, it's quite useful there. Anyways, just to finish up, uh, a couple resources. Um, Hopefully now the docs on docs.ceph.org will make a little bit of sense to you because you know what these, uh, what the different terms mean and, and what the different architectural pieces of a Ceph cluster are. Um, Sage uh, gave a really interesting talk at, at Linux Conf AU in 2014. Um, he used an example of building an email storage system as an example and, and how you could potentially use uh, the Rados cluster to do that. And I thought it was a particularly intriguing example that I have not heard anyone actually implement yet. And I kind of want to just to say that I did, but I also don't aspire to be an email admin. Yes? You said .seth.org? Oh, .com. It is .com, sorry. Okay. Uh, comment was about my missaying of the, of the domain name. Um, the last one, uh, Sebastian Hahn uh, has some a lot of really good uh, blog entries, you know, little short snippets about uh, different aspects of Ceph, particularly in the context of OpenStack. And I have found a lot of his information to be useful uh, over my, my first year or so uh, picking up uh, uh, maintenance of a Ceph cluster. So, anything else? Can you flip back to the very first page that had the hyperlink to your slides? Yeah, I can do that. And there's a link to the slides. Yes? So is uh, three servers the general minimum to start a set cluster? Yes. Three servers is generally considered to be the minimum. You can pull it off with just one. Um, I mean, if you're just doing testing or, or demo purposes, one would be sufficient to get started. But if you're talking about a pr production use case, three would definitely be, be the minimum there. And, and I haven't built any this big, but there I've heard of shops that are doing thousands of OSDs in single clusters. So it can scale to, to large environments. Um, our use cases, uh, due to you know, concerns about failure scenarios and whatnot, we, we make intentionally build them smaller than that. But I've still got ones that are well into the several hundreds of OSDs. In fact, all three of my production clusters have over 100 OSDs in them. How many monitors does it take to control it? So the, the question is how many monitors does it take to control that? The, the monitors do not need to scale with the number of OSDs. They, sc they scale independently. Um, so you can do that with just three OSDs if you or three monitors if you want. I would probably do five just as just as a failure scenario type situation, because like I said, you need a strict majority of the monitors. And so, say you're doing maintenance on one, and then another one dies. If you if you have lots of things, you, it's and lots of customers of the cluster, you know you want to be able to take one down at a time to do maintenance and not have to worry is something going to fail and, and kill my cluster. So um, we originally built our clusters with three. Um, I am in the process of, of adding two more to each to get them to five. Um, but we're, we're not going to go past that. How do you manage like, updates, like kernel updates? So the question is, how do you handle uh, updates to uh, your various systems? Um, you can do it however you want. Uh, if you want to do one of the hot patching mechanisms, you can. The nice thing is, since it's a, a system that handles faults uh, natively, you can just go ahead and reboot your boxes in a staggered fashion, and uh, everything will be just fine. Um, I actually just uh, two weeks ago went through an upgrade on one of our clusters where we updated the Ceph version from Hammer to Jewel, and uh, 
all I had to do was just go through a node at a time, update it, re, uh, restart services on that one, wait for recovery to finish, and move on to the next one. I did it without any downtime of customers and without the load on that cluster was pretty low, but they there was no impact on on the, the client performance during it. Were you yes. Able to, were you able to upgrade them and reboot them and have them, let's see, get back up before they were taken out? Is that the right? Term so so the question is, is it possible to to get them rebooted and get them brought back up before they get marked out? Um, yes, it is possible. Um, I have done that. Um, on my clusters, we still have it set as the default five-minute timeout before a, an OSD gets marked out when it, after it goes down. Um, my systems don't reboot that fast. It's all uh, the BIOS stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, server class hardware. For some reason, they decided it needs to take 12 minutes to initialize the motherboard firmware. Um, so, uh, a no out flag. Yes, and that's. It. I mean, we can come over here. Uh, if you're doing something like that, you can do. Do that command, Ceph OSD set no out, and that uh, stops the cluster from marking an OSD that is down as out. So it will go down and, and the cluster will leave it there until you change something. Um, and then you can, when you're done, you can just, and actually first let me, uh, you can see when, when I do this, there's a warn um, saying that no out is set. Uh, another important thing, clocks are important. Um, it can handle some skew. It starts complaining if they're more than just a couple milliseconds off. Um, and it can handle, I, I've had them be seconds off, but I wouldn't recommend going much further than that. Use NTP. Um, VMs suck at timekeeping. Uh, but yeah, you can see it's a health warning, and then I, when I'm done with maintenance, I can just unset no out, and then that flag is now gone. It's not complaining about it. Is that generally better to set no out so that you're, I mean, what you're trying to accomplish is avoid rebuilding on a new host even when you know it's just going to yeah. come back? Yeah, so the question is, is it better to, to, to just set no out versus putting a higher time out or letting it start recovering on its own? Yes, it generally is. I have frequently forgotten to set that when I do maintenance, and so I'm waiting for the node to come back up, and all of a sudden I'm watching the other screen with the CephW output going by, and all of a sudden I see stuff explode. And I'm like, oh crap, I forgot no out. Um, the trick there is there's another flag called no backfill, which will stop it from moving data between nodes in a backfill operation. And so that just pauses the, the operation that they were doing. And then when the node comes back up, all the maps adjust back to how they were. And the, the node that was down gets caught back up and life goes back to normal. And I unset the two flags. So yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty versatile and robust system. Um, I, I can't say that we've never had an outage with it. Um, we have had uh, instances that have been a little bit of banging ahead against the wall. But they're, I mean, we, we've, it, we've been running them in production for a year and a half now. And it, there's just, to some extent, you just learn some things by doing it. And so, yeah. We, we haven't had anything major happen in, in a while. All right, well, uh, thanks for coming, guys. Hopefully you learned something.